the previous segment, we began to talk about the Industrial Revolution, and we began with agriculture. We explained that uh, the first and most important thing that happened in the Industrial Revolution is the transformation in agriculture that enabled uh, smaller and smaller numbers of farmers to produce more and more food. And this released the other people to move to the city and start working in factories and offices and producing all kinds of cars and refrigerators and whatnot. Um, this created, as we said in the last segment, a new problem. The modern capitalist economy must, all, must constantly grow, must increase production more and more in order to survive. If it doesn't grow, it collapses. It doesn't stay in place. However, it's not enough just to produce more and more. You have all these people coming from the villages to the cities and producing more and more cars and refrigerators and televisions and, and clothes and shoes and whatever. It's not enough just to produce them. Somebody must also buy all these products. If not, the industrialists and the investors will, will go bust. If you produce all the stuff and nobody buys it, you go out of business. To prevent this catastrophe and to make sure that people will always buy whatever new stuff industry produces, a new kind of ethic appeared. It was an ethical revolution. The new kind of ethics that appeared as a result of the Industrial Revolution was the ethic of consumerism. What is consumerism? Well, most people throughout history lived under conditions of scarcity. There was not enough. There was not enough of anything. So frugality was the, the main, uh, was a very important part of ethics. People believed that uh, being satisfied with the little that you have is good, and indulging yourself in luxuries, this is bad. This only evil people, corrupt people, indulge themselves in luxuries. A good person should avoid luxuries, should never throw away food. You always finish whatever your mother put you on, your, on your plate. And if your trousers get torn, you don't throw them away and buy a new pair, you, you mend them. This was a very important part of human morality. Only kings and aristocrats allowed themselves to publicly renounce such values of frugality and to conspicuously flaunt their riches by uh, building palaces and wearing gold and silver and, and, and silk clothing and so forth. Now, when the Industrial Revolution solved the problem of scarcity, that there is not enough, and instead created the problem of consumption, there are so many products, who is going to buy all this stuff? Then a new revolutionary ethic evolved, the ethic we call consumerism. Consumerism sees the consumption of more and more products and services as a good thing, as a positive thing. Consumerism encourages people to spoil themselves, treat themselves, even kill themselves by slowly uh, eat, uh, by, by, by eating too much. Instead, uh, consumerism sees frugality as a problem, as some kind of psychological disorder, some kind of disease that should be cured. Consumerism has worked very, very hard with the help of popular psychology and advertisements and TV and so forth to convince people that indulging yourself is good for you. Whereas frugality, being satisfied with little, this is self-oppression. This is something not good. If you want to buy a new clothes, go ahead, buy it. If you want a new car, take a loan from the bank and buy it. If you want to eat that cake, go ahead, eat it. You should, you should uh, treat yourself. You should listen to yourself. If you really want something, then just go ahead and do it. This is consumerism. Now, consumerism has succeeded 
in turning more and more segments of the human population in the world into very good consumers. We buy countless products that we don't really need and that we can't even afford and that until yesterday we didn't even know that they existed. Manufacturers actually deliberately design short-term goods uh, and invent all kinds of new and unnecessary models of perfectly satisfactory products just in order that we can purchase more and more uh, products every year. Shopping over the last century or so, shopping has become a favorite pastime of more and more people. And consumer goods have become essential mediators in relationships between family members, uh, spouses, friends, parents and children. If you want to express your feelings, you buy something for your friend or for your child or for your parent. Even religious festivals, religious holidays, like Christmas, became shopping festivals. In the United States, even Memorial Day, Memorial Day was originally a solemn day for remembering fallen soldiers that fell in defense of the United States in the world wars and other wars. Today, Memorial Day is uh, spent by many Americans by going shopping. There are special Memorial Day sales that the shops have because they know that people have free time during this day, so they attract them to the shops uh, with this uh, Memorial Day, Day sales. Perhaps they think that uh, 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 the defenders of the United States, what they really wanted us to do in order to commemorate their sacrifice is to go shopping to prove that they did not die in vain. This rise of the new ethic of consumerism is manifested perhaps most clearly in the food market. Traditional agricultural societies lived in constant fear of hunger and starvation. Today, in the affluent world, one of the leading problems, one of the leading health problems is not starvation, it's obesity. And actually the poor are more in danger, in danger than the rich. At least in the United States, the poor are more in danger of obesity because they stuff themselves with hamburgers and pizzas. Whereas the rich eat all kinds of organic salads and fruit shakes, so they are less in danger. Each year, the population of the United States spends more money on diets than the money which is needed to feed all the hungry people that remain in the world. This phenomenon of eating far too much and then doing all kinds of diets and exercises is actually a double victory for consumerism. Instead of eating little, which will lead to economic stagnation because you don't need all the food that the companies are producing. People eat far too much and then they buy diet products and go to the gym and thereby they contribute double to the economic growth. First they contribute to all the companies that produce all this unnecessary food and then they cont contribute to all the companies that produce diet products and, and, and gyms and, and, and so forth. How can we square this consumerist ethic with the capitalist ethic, which we spoke about in the previous lesson, the ethic of the, business of the businessman, businesswoman, according to which profits should not be wasted they should instead be reinvested in production. How to, to, to square these two different, one, one time we say go and buy, and sometimes we say no, you should invest in increasing production. How to account for the, for the gap? Well, as in previous eras, so also today, there is a kind of division of labor, division of efforts, between the elite and the masses. In medieval Europe, aristocrats spent their money carelessly on all kinds of luxuries, 
Now, as peasants, most of the population, they lived frugally, minding every penny not to waste it on unnecessary stuff. Today, we've simply switched roles. The rich now take great care managing their assets and their investments, whereas the majority of the public, the less, the less affluent people, they go into debt buying all kinds of cars and televisions and refrigerators and, holi and uh, holidays abroad, which they don't necessarily need and which they don't necessarily, they, they can't even afford. The capitalist and the consumerist ethical principle are therefore two sides of exactly the same coin. They are complementary, not contradictory. The rich, are, the rich are busy investing to produce more and more, and the poor are busy buying all that, uh, all that new stuff. And the new ethic is therefore a double ethic with two uh, complementary commandments. The supreme commandment of the rich is invest. You must invest your money. Don't waste it. The supreme commandment for all the rest of the people is buy. You must buy more. Even if you don't have enough money to buy that car, go to the bank, take a loan, and buy that car. This is your commandment. This is your role in the economy. This new capitalist, consumerist, double ethic is revolutionary in, uh, in many respects. Most previous ethical systems in history presented people with a very tough deal. Christianity or Buddhism or Confucianism, they promised people paradise, but only if they could cultivate compassion and tolerance, only if they could overcome their cravings, their anger, only if they restrained their selfish interests, only then they could get paradise. And this was too difficult for most people. So the history of ethics for hundreds of years is a very sad history of wonderful ideals that nobody can actually realize. Most Christians did not imitate Christ. They behaved very differently from, from, from Jesus Christ. Most Buddhists failed to follow the recommendations of Buddha, how to live their lives. Most Confucians would have called Confucius a temper tantrum if he could see how they are behaving. In contrast, what is revolutionary about the new capitalist consumerist ethic is that for the first time in history, most people actually do what they are asked to do. They actually live up to the ideal. The new ethic promises paradise here on earth on condition that the rich remain greedy and spend all their time making more and more and more money and on condition that the mass of people give freedom to their cravings and passions and buy more and more stuff. And this is the first religion in history whose followers actually do what they are asked to do. The rich are busy making more money, and the rest of the population is busy buying more and more stuff. How can we be sure that we really get paradise in return from all our effort? In our personal lives, we may not be so sure, but on television, television, uh, promises us, shows us that yes, if you buy all that stuff, you will uh, live in paradise. And if you are not in paradise yet, it is because you are still missing the latest model of this or that product or service. So the Industrial Revolution changed not only uh, the economy, but also ethics and morality. In the next lesson, we will see that the Industrial Revolution did something even more dramatic. It changed not only the economy, 
and ethics, it also fundamentally changed politics and society. As we shall see, society and politics today are totally different from what they were two or three hundred years ago before the eruption of the Industrial Revolution. Thank <laughs> you.